because not only did it flood the basement, but the basement had asbestos, so they have to abate it now because it was flooded. Thank you for being a devoted listener of this podcast, Beyond Clean with ACE, dedicated to healthy, positive, and proactive content to support individuals primarily in the cleaning industry. Are you a facilities manager, a frontline staff member, or a building services contractor and are looking for knowledge that will help you advance both personally and professionally? Beyond Clean with ACE is now in season seven and speakers have consistently brought us messages which parallel our key focus of providing proactive knowledge. Many times the conversations here go beyond cleaning toilets, windows, and floors and helping individuals on a personal level. Subscribe and share with others so that everyone's life can be enhanced in healthy, positive, and proactive ways. And now, let's join Dave Thompson, Director of the Academy of Cleaning Excellence and your host here at Beyond Clean with ACE. Good morning, everyone. This is Dave Thompson. I'm your host here at Beyond Clean with ACE, where the cleaning industry talks. And, you know, it's our first broadcast here of our podcast of 2023, but we start our season back in December because about seven years ago, we started this podcast in December. And, you know, I've talked with thousands of people over the years. And uh, now if you didn't, if you didn't get it, you might want to go back to the podcast I did right at the end of the last year, because one of the great podcasts I did was with a gentleman that was at a circus. And I got to tell you, of all the ones I've done, please go back and listen to that. We've got it now on YouTube. So if you're watching on YouTube, uh, welcome to our uh, video podcast now. Uh, we're doing it both ways. Eventually, we'll probably go back to live, but right now we're recording them, uh, playing with a number of different things, so bear with us. Anyway, as we usually do every, well, month on a Monday, and we kind of backed it up a one week because of the start of the year, but, uh, you know, I have a guest that is with me every year. Um, gosh, I don't know how I roped him into it, but he keeps coming back for more. Sean good morning, Moore. Dave. Good hey, morning, Dave. How are you? Doing good. Um, I don't know if you got to, to uh, look at some of the podcasts from last year, but I was just telling everybody about the one I did with Dave Letterfly. Probably one of the most interesting podcast guests I've had, and we got a chance to go to the circus and do video with him. Uh, I got to tell you, they're, they're, you know, that's one of the fun things about podcasting. You run into some really unique people. So you actually went to the circus and saw like a Barnum, Barnum and Bailey circus kind of thing? There you go. Yeah. I mean, you know, here, I, you know, would not be the one thing I would have thought of on a podcast that I go do, but Sean, uh, you know, just like you and I doing all the things that we've done over the years, I think that's an interesting thing about the cleaning industry. We get everywhere. We're everywhere. Oh yeah. If there's a floor, we're there. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and in this case, there wasn't any floor. It was all dirt. <laughs> <laughs> they still have to clean that dirt up though, Dave, because I have horses. You know, it, it was, it was really interesting folks. So I, did, I just had to start out this year by saying, you know, uh, we do this every month uh, with Sean and got him on here. I don't know. We're probably what, three or four years now into this, Sean? Yes, I believe it's three years. And we've had a lot of fun doing it too. I've learned a lot. You've, you've taught me a lot. It's been fun to kind of go through this kind of this thing and um actually put me a little bit more out in front of my customers, which has been a, a blessing. Well, you might notice, folks, uh, if you're on the uh, audio podcast, of course, you can't see this, but if you're watching on YouTube, you're watching uh, the uh, video part of this. So we've kind of switched a little bit of our format this year, learning a few things. Um, but, you know, the basis of what we talk about is anything that has to do with commercial cleaning. And Sean, I got to tell you, over the holidays, I had a challenge. What was that? The roof, the ceiling in my classroom fell in. Oh. <laughs> yeah. I'm not, over, 
Well, I have to say, I might not be as surprised in that building. That building was there when the Civil War was enacted. <laughs> Folks, what we're talking about is a classroom uh, uh, that I have is inside of a building that's a uh, little over 100 years old. What I learned, Sean, uh, when I came to clean up all of the issues that was left by the ceiling collapse is it wasn't just the insulation, it was sawdust from the original factory where the, the, from the building. Wow. So it had been sitting up there between the roof and the ceiling for who knows how long. Probably better part of 90 plus years. Wow. And it covered everything. So I spent, uh, they, they came in and cleaned up the biggest part of it and everything. But then whenever I came in, I had to go through and do the dusting and uh, picking up and everything. And of course, folks, with my COPD, of course, I couldn't do any vacuuming. I thought it was interesting. My wife sends me a note. She says, so this, the teacher has become the student. Now you know to damp dust, right? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that, was, that was my fun challenge over the holidays. Sean, uh, how did the uh, year wind up for you? Well, it uh, wound up really good. I was really blessed with the sales that I had for the year. Um, it was one of the best years I've ever had in my career, which I was very happy with. Um, my volume increased in healthcare and in uh, primary and secondary education, which was a, uh, you know, truly blessed my numbers for the year. Uh, the very last part of the year was busy. I have a major university that I do a lot of work with, and they uh, had an area where the football players were coming back the first week of January and they had ordered a custom carpet. So we had to overnight the carpet on a truck on the 28th of December or it arrived on the 28th. It left on the 27th and arrived at the university on the 28th and then was installed and done before the 5th of January. We got it done. It was just one of those hot rush things. And then that same day that the carpet arrived at that same university, their library flooded, uh, oh. one of their libraries. So the the primary basement and the sub-basement both flooded with over six or eight inches of water. Um, didn't damage any of the books that were archived there. Thank goodness they were up on um, rack systems, but the uh, all the flooring was damaged. So I had to go over there and walk the job with the facility director and come up with a solution on what we were going to do to to uh, get flooring there quickly so we've worked through all that now we're waiting for a final uh purchase order from the general contractor that's doing the cleanup to get the uh carpet on the way so they can have it there when they get through doing the cleanup because not only did it flood the basement but the basement had asbestos so they have to abate it now because it was flooded yeah so, that's what happens in these old buildings right you one thing leads yep. to another right Exactly. It had uh, the the primary basement had two layers of VCT. The top layer was conventional 12 by 12. And then the second layer was uh, the old eight by eights on asbestos cutback adhesive. So uh, they couldn't really do anything other than remove the water until they got an abatement company in there to uh, remove everything else. So that's what they're doing right now is abate the space. Three, three layers of flooring, and then they've got to go in. Uh, they're going to be sealing in the concrete and doing a moisture thing on it. So, yeah, they've they've got air dryers running in there as they abate. And then after, once they run the abatement chemical on the concrete, um, you know, there's a tons of little fissures and different holes and places sure. that were drilled and things all over the years. So we have to allow it to stay open for at least seven to ten days. Uh, once the abatement is complete to allow the chemicals from the abatement process to evaporate out of those fissures and drill holes and bolt holes and all that kind of stuff. Um, then they're going to go back in and we'll uh, actually test the moisture at that point to find out what the relative humidity and the pH is on the concrete. I don't, I don't think we have a moisture problem based on the location of the building and the age of it. We haven't had a moisture problem other than the, the moisture introduced uh, by the busted pipe. Right. So we'll probably just um, do a cementitious underlayment skim coat and then uh, go down with the carpet tile after that. I don't, I don't perceive it us to have a moisture issue in that building, but we don't know until we actually drill it and test it. You know, folks, I got to tell you, this is the thing about doing the podcast that we really enjoy with Sean. 
<clears throat> is that a lot of us don't realize all of these issues that go along with it. It's not as simple as eh, pull the carpet up and put some more down. No, it's it it abatement creates a lot of issues. We've learned this over the years. Abatement, uh, we've put flooring in too quickly after abatement. Um, we had one job that uh, in the past that we put a floating floor in and the over an abated surface and the abatement chemical was actually eating the vinyl in the floating LVT. Um, we didn't realize that that was going to happen. That was a lesson learned. This was one of our first abatement jobs about six years ago. And that, that, that's why I mentioned fissures, uh, bolt holes, places where things were drilled into the floor, all those kinds of areas hold that moisture, that chemical down there. And if you don't allow it to evaporate, um, you're going to have problems because it's going to come out. It's going to evaporate. You know, Sean, when we talk about this, this is usually the issue, right, is that we bring up these things because we've learned over time. And that's what continuing education is all about, folks. It's it's about learning and then bringing that into our narrative and then keeping that uh, in the forefront when these situations come up and sharing that with people. Yeah. My old adage, I always say, I've said it many times on the podcast is the only thing that I leave this world with is my knowledge. If I don't pass my knowledge and my, the end things that I've learned um, over to the next person who comes along, then I haven't done what I should do as a human. And that's why we have the podcast, folks. It's free to listen. Uh, so please share and like uh, this podcast, whether you're on YouTube or on Podbean, uh, because that's what it's all about. As we started the show with today, you know, we had a great podcast with that gentleman and we had plenty of them last year. I think we probably booked almost 60 podcasts last year, folks. So a lot of good information there. And the wonderful thing about podcasting is it's always there. You can always share it. So there's seven years worth of stuff, folks, to go back and listen to and get education and knowledge from. Um, carpet is what the challenge was. But I want to go back into last year, Sean, a little bit and go, what was the the largest um, you know, challenge of the year? I mean, you know, as you look at things, was it, uh, you know, what type of flooring? Because you're in the flooring business. So our largest challenge is it, it continues to be sheet vinyl. Uh, 12 foot, 6 foot, 9 foot, uh, homogeneous or heterogeneous sheet vinyl. That's the biggest challenge that we face on our side, mainly because of installation. Uh, I always, I did a presentation for a hospital and one of the things I put up there was a, an example of a motor from 1968 in a vehicle. If you can change, if I, if you've got a wrench uh, and I give you the right socket, I can probably show you how to change the spark plugs on a 1968 big block, right? There's plenty of room to get into the engine bay. The wires are right there. I, you can get right to it. And I can probably explain how to do it. But if we take that process and try to apply it to a Ferrari F40, that's not the same situation. You have to have a truly certified technician because they have to pull the motor on the vehicle in order to change just the spark plugs and to do simple service on the on the vehicle. It doesn't even use a spark plug, spark plug like what you would know about. Probably not. So <laughs> uh, that is kind of comparing a sheet vinyl installer to an LVT installer. So we've got a lot of LVT installers out there that kind of learn on the fly. Um, and that's presented its own set of problems. But with the sheet vinyl, that's been an extreme problem because we don't have any more of the tradesmen. The tradesmen are getting to be my age, 55, 60 years old. And, uh, you know, they're just very few and far between. And there's not really that many new guys learning how to install sheet vinyl. Uh, it's, so it's interesting that you brought that up because one of the things that I was doing is I was looking at, you know, upcoming uh, things for the flooring industry. And uh, folks, if you're watching the video, the reason I'm looking is I've got another screen, so I'm trying to make sure I talk about the right thing here. Um, but it says, new for 23, the international surface event. And one of the things they're talking about is laminate, SPC, LVP, and they've got a new deal 
National Installer of the Year competition. I thought that was interesting because, you know, that's what you talked about last year was installation at the first of the year. And here you are, first of this year, and we're still talking about installation issues. Yeah, that's, you know, we all have trade shows. We have trade shows like you and I are doing on maintenance. We have trade shows on product. We have trade shows on um, all different types of things where you bring construction shows together like Neocon in Chicago. There are very few that I know of installation uh, trade shows where we actually bring the installer. Most of the time because the installer works by the piece. And if he's not on his knees installing, he's not making money <laughs> and he can't afford to be at a trade show for a week. Yeah, but, uh, that's, that's, but, that's, but that's wrong, though. Correct. That's always been my argument. I always say I've told different manufacturers that I've worked for over the years, why don't we hold installation seminars? Um, and they we we do try to. We have over the years and we get uh, little or no participation. The places where I do get participation are flooring contractors that have employees that work by the hour. So when they're there at the trade at the installation seminar where I bring Dennis Gustavus, our installation coordinator, in from Manning, for example, um, if it's an hourly shop, they are getting paid while they're learning how to install sheet vinyl. But there's very few of those, from what I'm understanding you saying. There is very few of those. I, there's probably maybe three of those in my territory, in my South Georgia, North Florida territory that have employees. So uh, to get installers to come is difficult. And a lot of times the flooring contractor that hires subcontractors does not want to pay for the installer who is a sub to come to a training seminar because in their mind they feel that if they train that installer how to install better, he'll go to work for somebody else and then their money is not not been well spent they don't get a return on their investment you know sean i've heard that because you know we here at the academy of course you know we're all about education and 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 getting people in and and that's what it's all about but you know it's you know i get i get two things one is the contractors don't want to come and sit in the same room because they're competitors and they don't want to have an open discussion and i so i've gotten that and the other I've got is, like you said, if I bring my people and I educate them, then they're liable to you know, get their stuff and start on their own. Or if they leave, they take that education with them. I go, yeah, but it's kind of like if you don't have that piece of equipment, you never know what you're missing until you have it. Well, our, the flooring industry in general, since I've been in it for 30 some odd years, is a race to the bottom. It's a race <laughs> for who, who can get it the most inexpensively. Uh, you know, the three bid scenario I've talked about before about hard bidding a job where you get the, the lowest vendor wins the project. Right. The, and then, you know, the general contractor, if he doesn't scope that vendor correctly, then you have all different types of issues that come up where they have to charge change orders and ultimately become more expensive than the high bidder was. So th that is a problem with the business. It hasn't been corrected. They've tried a couple of times uh, back in the in around 1999, 1998, 99, 2000, the manufacturers uh, tried to get into the flooring contractor business. Several manufacturers bought uh, flooring contractors across the country. And so the, the thought process being like uh, a dealer, uh, automobile dealership, if you want a Ford, you go to a Ford dealership. Right. If you want a Chevy, you go to a Chevy dealership. Well, that, that process didn't work because when you went to the general contractor, the way the, the jobs are set up, that if when, like for instance, at the time I worked for a company called Bentley Print Street. Well, Bentley uh, was owned by Interface, who had bought this group of companies called Resource for Floors. So Resource was our vendor. So if I if my product was specified on Bentley, and we went said the only supplier you can get it from is Resource, the GC's like, well, we're going to switch it because we can't get a good price. If that's the only guy that offers it, he's going to charge us too much for it. And that's the theory going through it when, in fact, there may be some of that, but the percentage of difference between a low bid and a high bid is usually pretty small. Right. And you get the, 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 uh, the extra service from a vendor who works with somebody all the time. And it, I guess it's just an argument that can go on forever as to far right. as who's right. 
But yeah, I mean, it, you know, in, in all the years of being in the cleaning industry, Sean, I got to tell you, you know, it's it's really no different here. You know, um, our sponsors, Jim Supply folks, if you didn't already know that, uh, we appreciate their sponsorship here at the podcast. But, you know, it, the cleaning industry has been much the same way. Uh, and just like you, many of the cleaning distributors, you know, started their own cleaning business because they knew how to do it. And then they're in competition with the contractors that they sell to. And then here you go with this round robin and, uh, you know, and, and there's got to be something said for flooring. And the reason I, I say that, folks, is because flooring is the number one thing that covers the building and gets the most abuse. And if you're not working with the same people all the time, you're going to get a hodgepodge of a mess. And that's where you're talking about the installer, all the way from the installation, all the way through the maintenance, correct? Correct, because the, the hospital that I mentioned I was working with earlier, uh, they had brought me in. They're, they're contemplating moving away from sheet vinyl and going to LVT, which most hospitals already have done that. Um, they Their chief complaint to me when they, when they asked me to come in and speak to them was, um, we just can't get sheet vinyl installed properly. And once I'd walked the facility, I went in and met with their facility designer, architect, uh, different uh, uh, facility directors that run different parts of the hospital. It was about 25 people in a meeting. And once I started the meeting, I said, I've walked the facility. I've looked at it. I've, I've run my product in here several times. Uh, you guys have specified my product and purchased it. And you don't have a sheet vinyl problem. You have a labor problem. And that labor problem is your three bid scenario that you put every one of your jobs out to bid. I, I told them that most of the hospitals that I work with have a flooring contractor that does 90% of the work in that facility. And that's the, the reason is because if they have a flood in an operating room, or something goes down in an operating room, that, that is a money generating thing for the hospital system. And that, or it's, it, if you want to base it down to healthcare, it, you know, if there's an, a, a multi-car accident on an interstate and they bring in six people that need to have emergency operations and they don't have an operating room, then that's a problem. There's multifaceted reasons why the operating room has got to be running. And so, so if you have so if you're having the same contractor working on all of this, they know what has happened, they know how to take care of it, they can handle it quickly and efficiently and get that that facility or that area back in service. Uh, and and this is what so many people don't understand is that keeping a floor in service affects the whole way the whole operation runs. And additionally, that, that also means that that contractor will take that call at one o'clock in the morning because he knows it's from the hospital. If it's a if it's a subcontractor that bid it for the lowest price, he's not going to take the call at one o'clock in the morning from a hospital. Uh, so that's where that relationship. So that's what I was working with the, the that hospital to talk to him about maybe doing a, a uh, RFQ re request for quotation on uh, labor and pick three contractors and use them interchangeably throughout a year or two years and then choose one to work with or choose one to renew with um, in order to create that relationship so that you do have that kind of thing. Because if you keep bringing in and doing the low bid, you're going to continue to, you know, expecting something different after doing it the same way over and over again. You know, what's so interesting, Sean, as you bring this up uh, this morning is, and I never have understood why we always have to take the low bid. I don't know what created that mentality. The reason I would believe that you should take bidding is so that you can qualify the bidder that you award it to. Um, but have you ever understood exactly why we absolutely have to take the low bid? It supposedly it's for fairness. But yeah, but is, it, but is it fairness, the overall picture? It's not just the dollars, it's the whole value. And value is different than the bid price. Well, it used to, the GSA, the General Service Administration for the United States government, had a thing that was called best value. So they could actually take a product that was higher priced because it was a better value for the job and had a longer life cycle. Right. They've since abolished that. Um, and go, they don't even use the General Service Administration contract anymore. They do, but they they uh, actually 
bid it out. So the bid process can get very convoluted. I've had some of these government entities where they'll call me, they'll call Interface, they'll call Mohawk, and they'll ask all three of us to come out and provide a product that we feel is best and, um, and then submit a bid on the project, which typically on those process, those projects, I just don't participate because, you know, somebody's bringing a, a mallet, you know, a six pound sledge. One person's bringing a six pound sledge and the other person's bringing a mallet. You know, it just doesn't make any sense. You're never going to, the low price guy is going to win that job every time. Yeah, I got to where that's what I did, Sean. I just, you know, over the years, I'm just like, I don't need that. I need loyalty. I need trust. I right. need I need people that understand value. And that's, uh, you know, how we run our show here at the Academy. Um, you know, we set our price. It's fair. We give you value for what you get. We offer a money back guarantee if you're not happy with it. And, you know, that's the that's the customers we're we're after. Uh, and that's who comes to our classes every year, and we appreciate them. Well, that's what I look at as far as life cycle cost. You know, is is how long are you going to keep the product on the floor? Because we had a, there was a big thing went through the industry also about sustainability and recyclability and all that. And I had a job in uh, South Florida that uh, I lost the job to someone else. My argument on it was that they told me that my product was made too far away from the job site. Uh, my argument to them is that this wasn't the case, but you know, I was trying to create doubt is what if the product that you're getting the points for, for lead to get your sustainability rating that you want is the worst polluter in Georgia. Are you gaining anything by using a product that's closer just because you get the points? Um, my product is brought over on a train, which is less environmentally intrusive. It's has a lot of, you know, it, it actually uses less, fuel than what it does to bring the product from Georgia. So there's a lot of different things that go into projects and life cycle costings and, and different examples that you can give. But that's what I try to sell on is life cycle cost and how long the product's going to be on the floor, how sustainable it's going to be on the floor and how long it's going to last for the money that you pay. So folks, as you listen to the podcast this morning, as we start our new year, you might be interested to find out that we don't talk about just one thing. And I think that's what you're learning here. We've went from, you know, the circus to, you know, the, the ceiling collapse to abatement on the concrete floor with the carpet uh, to bidding. If you've got a question when it comes to the cleaning industry, this is what the podcast is about. Now, Sean and I do this every month. We talk about anything and everything that hits our brain as it does, you know, most every, every day, just like you every day when you're out there in the field. And, you know, I love what you said, Sean, and I happen to agree, and I'm kind of living my life that way. This is why we give the value of our knowledge, because what am I else am I going to do with it at this point? Now, let's share it and, and put it out there. What's the challenge for 23? I think the challenge for 23 is to um, continue to provide service to the clients as they need it. I think we're our supply, if you go past most of the vehicle dealerships, now you're starting to see more trucks showing up. Uh, the supply chain's back online again. Um, I think certain parts of the country are going to get hurt more than others when this economy finally decides to slow down a little bit. I'm hoping and praying that here in North Florida or in Florida in general, we're going to be a little bit insulated from that because we've got a lot of people moving from what they call blue states to move to Florida. Uh, we've had a, a huge influx in uh, people come, families, workers, everything coming to Florida. I know around here, at least in my area, the property prices have went up tremendously uh, per acre uh, compared to what they were five years ago. And I, I'm hoping that in my area, we're going to be insulated. As far as the, the push for next year is to continue to do the service and provide the service that... Uh, we've been trying to do and try to improve the service and bring out more product because we have definitely been slow at bringing out product. Well, I think that, you know, the supply chain is probably going to be one of those things that everybody's going to fight through this year. I agree with you. I know whenever I'm out on the, on the road, there's way more, tra way much more traffic than there was this time last year. Yeah, I, we, 
my wife and I had made a trip to uh, that day. We went to Tallahassee <clears throat> together to look at that job. She actually rode with me and we were on interstate 10. And as soon as we got on I-75, the traffic traffic tripled. So right. I-10 going east to west was nothing, but north and south was tripled to what it was on I-10. So there is almost, I mean, excuse me, on I-75. And we, we had made a recent trip to Atlanta the traffic was just bumper to bumper the entire time we went to Atlanta. So that, you know, that corridor is crazy. That's why we call it beyond clean because here now we're talking about traffic. You traffic. Know, and it, <laughs> you know, it, it, it does, it affects our whole life. All of these things uh, goes into making a day, a week, a month, a year. Um, you know, as most people do folks uh, here at the first of the year, I look at a lot of different websites. Um, you know, I have to work on several ones here for uh, Jim Supply and the Academy. And um, I was looking at uh, the Mannington website, and I noticed that things have changed over the last year because the first thing that comes up is a whole section on LV products where it used to be carpet was the first things you saw when you looked at the at the website. Um, any thoughts on on that? I know you don't run it, but... No, but I mean, we're we're a company that we're privately owned company, but we respond to the market. Um, in 2015, Mannington had, I think, approximately 40 some odd percent of the LVT business uh, across the commercial side. That, I think, has diminished a little bit due to the amount of people who's got or companies that's got into the business of LVT, either through distribution or they're buying material overseas and bringing it over or they're manufacturing itself. There's all different facets of that. Uh, that the versatility of LVT and LVP is tremendous. You can do different patterns. Uh, as I mentioned before, installation's a little bit less complicated because you're working with individual pieces, putting a puzzle together on the floor. So it's a little bit, um, easier to work with and the designs have changed tremendously and the custom capabilities are, are amazing as well. We're able to print on top of LVT now. So that I think that versatility has, a, has made the market completely change and people like hospitals I go into now, they don't even use carpet at all. They've removed it from the entire system, even in administration. So, the carpet business is, you know, as as the Broadloom did business did many years ago when carpet tile came along, the carpet tile business has now diminished back from the LVT. Everywhere you would use carpet, now you can use LVT. Uh, now, you know, what's interesting as I looked at and I scrolled further down, I see rugs and I'm like, rugs from Mannington Mills? I'm like, uh, carpet and tile is what I've always known. Rugs? Well, you know, if you have a hard surface area, it's like selling a tie with a suit. If you have a hard surface area, you need an area rug for sound or that kind of thing. So that's how we've got into the area rug business. We were we uh, re most recently procured uh, Atlas Maslin, which was a commercial uh, market name for another manufacturer and that had combined with Atlas and Maslin became Atlas Maslin and we purchased all their machines and, and their rug program, which is tremendous. I just did a custom rug the other day that's completely custom made with New Zealand wool uh, that you can do any shape, design, pattern, anything you can design on a computer, you can make on a rug. And that's been a, a huge asset. Like I mentioned, it's like selling a tie with a suit. If you sell the hard surface, and you have a lobby to do, you can put an area rug under the seating area in the in the front lobby. Uh, so now that was one of the it. things that I was going to ask you, Sean, here, because as I looked at it, I'm thinking, now rugs usually are all kinds of different material, and you just said New Zealand wool. So now we're going to have to start talking about people in the cleaning industry going back to learn how to clean natural fiber products instead of synthetic carpets. You stump a bunch of water on it. <laughs> and then the rug shrinks. Uh, anyway, I, 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 I was just going to wait for the rest of that story there, Sean. Yeah. I mean, because this is what people with, and, we, and we've been talking about this forever, right? With the broad loom carpets, 
I mean, you just rinse them, you just flush them. But now if you start talking about a wool rug and you dump all that kind of water on there, or you take a bonnet to a wool rug, uh, you're going to be buying a wool rug. Yeah, that's one of the things we haven't addressed completely. We've brought the product. Um, I think we were we were fortunate to get the product when they, when we purchased Atlas Maslin. Um, I really haven't, to be honest with you, until the, right this moment, I hadn't even thought about. I, I am going to have to talk about maintenance on New Zealand wool rugs, which probably means the rugs are going to have to be rolled up, transported out of the building, and taken to a professional cleaner, and then cleaned and then brought back. That's typically how those wool rugs are done. Well, I've got a story for you on that one, folks, but I got a carpet care class tomorrow. I'm going to be doing carpet over at Raymond James Stadium over in Tampa Bay. And that happens to be one of the things we're going to talk about during that class. That's why we have classes here at the Academy, because, you know, whenever I get with a commercial cleaner, I never know what their challenge is going to be. So whenever we have a class, I need to cover all of this. And so... You know, folks, as you look at your maintenance program, the challenge is not just learning how to work with one. I think that's what we're talking about here in our podcast today, folks. Don't think about only one challenge, one type of floor, because uh, even in a building, you've got multiple different types of floors. If you're a contractor, you never know where the next challenge is going to come from. Yeah. And. The other thing I usually always talk about with maintenance too that you often do is different parts of the building have different traffic patterns and have different amounts of traffic and different soiling. So you have to clean those areas more often than you do other areas. And trying to commit to a plan for the building and for the the system that you're working within is what you have to do. And, and so you identify the floor, identify the traffic pattern, identify the frequency, and then that gives you a successful cleaning program. Folks, I think Sean just wrapped up our podcast for today. I usually ask him what to say, but at the end, I think he just did it right there. So I'm going to just say, folks, that's our podcast for today. You've noticed on the video podcast, beyondcleanwithace.com, please like and share us. If you're on YouTube, it's at Academy of Cleaning. Um, please like and share us. Uh, subscribe to our channel there so you can ca uh, catch all the new podcasts for this year. Sean, uh, we will be talking with you again next month. And of course, April the 6th, Sean's going to be our keynote speaker at our cleaning festival and Rockstar Talk. So uh, be sure to go online. You can go to academyofcleaning.com. You can go to cleaningfestival.com. Yeah, I know. I'm giving you all kinds of dot coms places, folks, because like I said, with websites, we got information going all over the place. A lot of things going on this year. So, uh, We've got four of the trade shows coming up here that we're doing ourselves. Yeah, I think it'll be fun. I'm looking forward to getting those getting those done and seeing who, who comes and uh, just learning and teaching and being a part of it. I mean, looking forward to it. Sean, get out there and um, take care of those challenges in the maintenance field like we always do. All right. Appreciate it, Dave. Have a great week. Folks, be sure that you like and share us here at beyondcleanwithace.com, and we will see you next time. Don't forget, we've got a live show every Monday afternoon at 2.30. It's Cleaning with the Academy, where I well give you that week's hacks, and it's an open one-hour conversation. Uh, if you have a question, you have a thought, you have a success, we're going to be live on Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube this afternoon at 2.30. Please join us every week. Till later, we're off.